joining the Division of Rheumatology Grand Rounds. Just a couple of reminders before we start. This session is currently being recorded and it will be posted later on our website. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please add your questions to the Q&A feature um, so that we can um, easily moderate them. And now I'll let Dr. Lude introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Danielle. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rao. Dr. Rao is an, a, a rheumatologist and immunologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He serves as co-director of the Center for Cellular Profiling at Brigham. And his work focuses on identifying the immune cell phenotypes and pathways that characterize distinct autoimmune diseases. So using high dimensional analysis, including mass spectrometry and RNA-seq of samples from patients with RA and lupus, he led a study that identified a population of T peripheral helper cells that is uh, pathologically expanded in multiple autoantibody associated diseases. His ongoing work focuses on interrogating pathologic T cell B cell interactions in autoimmune diseases and comparing abnormal T cell phenotypes that appear in different autoimmune conditions. Dr. Rao has published extensively on adaptive immunity in rheumatic diseases with several papers in Nature, Nature Immunology, Science Translation of Medicine, Journal of Clinical Investigations, and so forth. Um, and finally, he has received several prestigious awards, including a career award for medical sciences from the Burroughs Wellcome Fund and a Clinical Scientist Development Award from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation to support these investigations. And finally, last year, he was also awarded the Dubois Memorial Lecture given to young outstanding lupus investigators. So it goes without saying that Dr. Dr. Rao is a stellar researcher and a rising star, and we much look forward to what you have to share with us today. So thank you for coming. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Christian, for the introduction. and. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry not to be there in person, um, but uh, looking forward to, to discussing some of these topics with you today. So I, I'm going to talk about immune profiling in patients with rheumatic diseases. Uh, these are my disclosures. And I'm going to start with um, a question that, that uh, sometimes comes up in, in rheumatology clinic. So actually I had a clinic this morning, uh, saw a few patients here, um, and, and sometimes the questions will come uh, from patients about whether their immune system is, is acting properly, or sometimes someone will expect uh, suspect that they have something autoimmune or something sort of funny going on with their immune system. And you'll hear questions like, um, is my immune system out of whack or is it overactive? Or sometimes is it going rogue? And these are particularly challenging questions for us to address as rheumatologists because we don't really have the tools to interrogate what the immune system is doing to, to answer this. Now, if you think about what a cardiologist has, a cardiologist can assess the function of the heart with an echocardiogram quickly. And a pulmonologist can measure pulmonary function tests to see what the lungs are doing and if they're doing their job. And of course, we have kidney function tests and liver function tests but we don't really have an immune function test in the same way. So um, we struggle sometimes with uh, trying to understand what the immune system is doing in an individual patient. And we have some things that we can measure for the immune system. We can measure whether the major immune cell populations exist in normal numbers, monocytes, T cells, B cells, neutrophils. We can measure total immunoglobulins. We can measure total body inflammation with things like a CRP or an ESR. And we can measure some disease-specific features, for example, double-stranded DNA antibodies or complement levels in patients with lupus. Uh, but it's really quite a narrow view of what the immune system is doing. There are investigational techniques that can assess the immune system a little more broadly. For example, serum protein profiling or bulk transcriptomics of whole blood or sorted populations. And um, we've spent a lot of time with cytometric immunophenotyping, trying to count different types of immune cells that are present in blood or in tissue samples. And it's really this that I'm going to focus on today. And I'm going to talk um, about using cytometric immunophenotyping in three contexts. So I'm going to start in lupus. Uh, then I'm going to tell you some work about using these kinds of techniques in patients with really unusual undiagnosed diseases. And uh, finally, we'll talk about 
um, using this kind of approach to compare what goes on in induced autoimmunity, in this case, immune, uh, uh, immune adverse events after checkpoint blockade in comparison to spontaneous rheumatic diseases. So I'm not gonna talk per se about a specific disease here. Instead, I'm gonna talk about an approach of using a sort of detailed assessment of the immune system in patients to try and help us identify benchmarks to define disease and potentially to help us think about um, treatment strategies or how this, how this may help guide our selection of therapies. So um, we've been immunoprofiling samples from patients for the last several years. One of the techniques we use is this one, mass cytometry, where we take cells from either blood or a tissue, turn them into a single cell suspension, and then we analyze those cells uh, by incubating them with a cocktail of antibodies. And in mass cytometry, those antibodies are tagged with metals such, such that each antibody has a unique heavy metal tag associated with it. Those cells are then analyzed uh, one by one through a flow cell, this is where the cells pass through a torch that vaporizes the cell. It's essentially the temperature of the sun. And then that cloud of ions will be detected by a mass spectrometer. And the point of this is that you can measure the expression of a number of different proteins on or inside the cells at single cell resolution. And with this, with this technique, you can measure 35, 40, maybe 45 markers on individual cells at one time. So with a, conceptually, this is a, the same as flow cytometry where the antibodies are tagged with fluorophores. Um, and it's the same idea as, as site-seq antibodies where the antibodies are tagged with oligonucleotides now in single cell RNA sequencing approaches. Uh, using a method like this, you can establish the composition of cells within a sort of complex mixture, mixture pretty easily. So here what we're looking at is uh, mass cytometry phenotyping of peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And in these plots, these are two-dimensional TSNE plots. Each tiny dot is a cell. The cells are arranged in this two-dimensional plot based on how similar they are to one another in a multi-dimensional way. So that cells that are similar to one another end up as a cloud or an island. And then the color represents the level of expression of the marker labeled at the top. So in these plots here, you can see all of these CD3 positive clusters in red. Amongst the CD3 positive T cells, there are CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. There are CD19 positive B cells and CD14 positive monocytes. And so relatively quickly, you can get a sense about the composition of the cells within a sample. And you can see that there's heterogeneity here. There are these little, um, outpouchings of T cells that have distinct phenotypes. And we've been interested to ask, using this kind of approach, can you define a signature of immune dysregulation in lupus? Um, and we started this several years ago using mass cytometry data that was generated by the Accelerating Medicines Partnership. And there, there are PVMC samples from 25 controls, 25 RA patients, 27 patients with biopsy demonstrated lupus nephritis. And here we're going to focus just on the CD4 T cells from these samples. And we asked, are there any CD4 T cell phenotypes or populations that are selectively enriched in patients with lupus compared to the controls? And as we did this with a dimensional reduction and clustering approach, we identified one cell population here, this metacluster 4 that's particularly enriched in patients with lupus compared to the controls. Now, it turns out that that cell population in Metacluster 4 has a particular phenotype. I'm not going to take you through all the details of it, but those cells express high levels of PD-1 and ICOS. They tend not to express CXCR5. And you can gate those cells in a sort of biaxial, two-dimensional way um, uh, pretty easily. So here, what we're looking at is those same data now represented a different way, just uh, focused on memory CD4 T cells out of peripheral blood cells from either a control patient or a patient with lupus. And we're look at the, looking at the expression of PD-1 on the y-axis and CX05 on the x-axis. And you can see here in red, what's quantified is the population of PD-1 high CX05 negative T cells more abundant in patients with lupus compared to controls. And you can see that quantified on this plot on the right. 
So 27 patients with lupus nephritis, uh, high expansion of these cells with this phenotype, high expression of PD-1, absence of CXCR5, uh, much higher than what you see in the controls, and rheumatoid arthritis patients are somewhere in the middle. Now, um, we were quite pleased to see this result a couple of years ago when we were doing this because this cell phenotype is actually one that we knew quite well. Uh, this is a population of T cells that we had previously described abundant in the synovium of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And at that time, we had called them T peripheral helper cells or TPH cells to sort of capture the idea that these are B cell helper T cells. I'll show you the schematic of that to sort of capture this idea. So um, in lupus, we think that the interaction between T cells and B cells and the activation of B cells is important. Um, there has been a lot of focus on T cell B cell interactions as an important driver in lupus pathology. And uh, on the T cell side, much of the interest is focused on a population of T cells that are sort of regarded as the prototype of a B cell helper T cell. And that's the T follicular helper cell or TFH cell. TFH cells are marked by this expression of PD-1 <clears throat> and a chemokine receptor, CXCR5. These CXCR5 positive cells will follow a ligand, CXCL13, into the follicles of secondary lymphoid organs like lymph node and spleen. And there in those follicles, they produce factors like IL-21 or CXCL13 to recruit and stimulate a B cell response. And this interaction is critical for the generation of high affinity antibody producing B cells in the germinal center. When we had gone looking for cells like this in inflamed tissues, and in particular, we were looking at the synovium in rheumatoid arthritis patients, we came across a T cell population that looked similar, but with some key differences. We found a PD-1 high T cell population that didn't express CXCR5, but instead expressed a set of chemokine receptors that we think of as associated with migration to inflamed tissue, CCR2, CCR5, CX3, CR1, chemokine receptors that take cells out to sites of peripheral inflammation. And as we looked in the synovium of our RA patients, we could see this population of PD-1 high cells, lack CXCR5, but instead express things like CCR2. These cells make some of the same factors. They make IL-21, CXCL13, we think to recruit and stimulate a B cell response locally within a tissue, like the synovium in RA. And we propose the idea that these cells might be the primary drivers of this B cell activation within the inflamed synovium. So to capture this idea that they're uh, B cell helpers that are helping in the periphery as opposed to in follicles, we call them T peripheral helper cells or TPH cells. And what I'm gonna suggest to you is that the expansion of PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells in lupus patients is this same population. So um, I won't take you through all the da data for this, but we've sorted those cells out of PBMCs from lupus patients, and we've shown that they produce IL-21 and CXCL13. In co-cultures, they can stimulate B cells to differentiate into plasma cells or plasma blasts. Um, so uh, by many metrics, they look very similar to the TPH population that we found in the synovium in RA. Now, it turns out that the expansion of, of PD-1 high TPH cells is quite a consistent one uh, observed in multiple cohorts of patients from different studies. So on the left here are the data that we were just looking at from the Accelerating Medicines Partnership cohort, controls, RA patients, lupus nephritis patients. This observation about a increased frequency of PD-1 high, CXCR5 low or negative cells, was actually described a few years before this by Joe Kraft's lab uh, here are quite clearly expanded in patients with lupus compared to controls. This has been also observed in a cohort of patients from Japan, reported by Makiyama and colleagues, and a cohort of patients in China, reported by Lin and colleagues. Uh, so I think you get the sense that this expansion of PD-1 high, CXCR5 negative, TPH cells, quite a consistent one in patients with lupus. Now, I'll, I'll mention that these cells have been recognized to be expanded across a range of other diseases. We won't talk about that today, but um, I think in general, sort of a theme that you can find an expansion of PD-1 high TPH cells in multiple diseases, especially those associated with the generation of autoantibodies. But if we come back to this idea of, can you define 
a signature of immune dysregulation in lupus, um, I would suggest that the expansion of TPH cells is, is part of that signature. Now, if we go looking at B cells from the same patients and sort of play the same game, take the B cells out of peripheral blood of patients with lupus, analyze them in a high dimensional way, cluster them into different populations and ask which B cell populations are most expanded in the peripheral blood of lupus patients compared to controls. I think what you come up with is this population, which is a CD11C positive B cell population. These are sometimes called age associated B cells. Now, we didn't discover this. This was reported by Inyaki Sands, uh, a population that was originally described by Mike Cancro and Pip Americ, um, but an expansion recognized in lupus patients by Inyaki, um, reproduced in this data set here from the AMP, uh, quite a clear expansion of CD11C positive B cells in patients with lupus compared to the controls. And you might notice that these two plots, TPH plot, ABC plot, they look quite similar. And th there's a reason they look quite similar. It's because these two populations are highly correlated across patients. So if we plot the frequency of TPH cells on the, on the x-axis and the frequency of CD11C positive B cells or age-associated B cells on the y-axis, uh, there's a strong positive correlation both uh, amongst the lupus patients and RA patients. And what I think this suggests is that these two populations of activated T cells and B cells reflect a common axis of lymphocyte activation that's clear, especially in lupus, that lupus patients oftentimes have uh, some activation of this axis that generates TPH cells and ABCs. Their exact relationship with each other is not quite clear, um, but this is a measure, I think, of the lymphocyte activation in patients with lupus. Now, we've been asking about this in more detail in other cohorts of patients. So for one, with Karen Kostenbader, who's here at the Brigham, we asked whether one could see some of these signatures of lymphocyte activation, even in patients with a new diagnosis of disease. So Karen had recruited a cohort of patients um, with a new diagnosis of lupus within six months uh, in patients who had not been treated with strong immunosuppressive therapies, although hydroxychloroquine was allowed. Uh, and on less than 10 milligrams of prednisone. And when we assess these populations in patients with um, a new diagnosis of lupus here labeled early, uh, we can similarly see an increased frequency of TPH cells and TFH cells, not quite the same extent of, of expansion of ABCs or age-associated B cells in this cohort, but an increase in plasma blasts in this cohort as well. So I think still a suggestion at this very early time point, you can see activation of this pathway. Now, um, each of these populations is sort of related. So the frequencies of TPH and TFH cells are highly correlated across patients. I just showed you that the frequency of TPH cells and ABCs is highly correlated. Um, plasma blasts as well tend to be higher in patients that have high frequencies of TPH or TFH cells. So these are not independent observations. We're sort of picking up on um, different features of, I think, what's a common axis. So we've started to ask, well, is there a way you can sort of put this together and um, turn it into something that's uh, more easily tangible? So one thing we came up with was something that we've called so far a lymphocyte activation score. And it's essentially a normalized score of the frequency of TPH cells, TFH cells, ABCs, and plasma blasts, and then combined into one metric. And we've started to ask, well, um, can we use this to start to assess differences between patients with lupus and controls? And if we, if we calculate such a normalized lymphocyte activation score in control cohorts or in early lupus patients or established lupus patients, I think it looks pretty good that this metric is different in the controls compared to in the lupus patients versus controls. And what I have in mind for this, where I think we're going with this, is, is sort of this situation. And, and actually, I saw a patient just like this this morning. Um, so here are the way it's, it's illustrated. It's a 28-year-old woman who's referred to rheumatology with arthralgias in the hands and wrists, fatigue, occasional rashes, Raynaud's phenomenon, a patient who on exam looks quite normal with no synovitis, no rashes that are evident, normal nail fold capillaries, and labs that show a positive ANA, 
with negative ENAs, so negative double-stranded DNA, rho, la, RNP, Smith, negative antiphospholipids, normal complements, normal ESR, CRP, negative UA. We see a patient like this, not uncommonly, and we're posed with the question, does this patient have lupus? And, and I think the honest answer is like, we're not sure. Uh, they're not sure. And oftentimes we'll ask patients like this to come back in six months and sort of reevaluate. And whenever I see a patient like this, I wonder what's the lymphocyte activation score in this patient? What's the level of TPH cells or ABCs? And would that be helpful? Now, I, I, we don't have data yet to prove that it, that it is helpful, but, but I, I think that it will be. Uh, and so we've sort of set up to test this. And uh, through the Center for Cellular Profiling here at the Brigham, uh, we uh, see patients who come with a question of lupus. Uh, and if they're willing, we, that we offer them enrollment in the, a study where uh, we collect a sample of blood. That blood uh, gets split essentially into two pools. A small amount of that blood is brought here. It's my lab where uh, we run relatively small flow cytometry panels. I think panels that could be adopted by a clinical flow cytometry lab uh, to quantify exactly this, TPH cells, TFH cells, ABCs, plasma blasts. And then we bank the rest of the blood for, for subsequent studies. But by the end of the day, uh, we will have calculated a lymphocyte activation score for that patient um, that uh, may capture this metric. You know, which, which we hope to be able to put together with measurements of double-stranded DNA titers and complements to sort of think about another feature of immune activation in these patients. So I can't prove this is useful yet, but we're working on it. So that's as much as I'm gonna say about lupus. Um, and I, I wanna then uh, tell you about some work that we've been doing trying to apply this line of thinking about immunophenotyping now to patients, not with a defined disease like lupus, but with, with sort of undefinable or undiagnosed disease. And so here we've been studying patients in the undiagnosed diseases network, which is a multi-center study funded by the NIH to evaluate patients with really unusual presentations. And that, that can be any kind of clinical presentation, but it includes patients with unusual inflammatory diseases. So uh, in collaboration with the UDN site, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network site uh, at Harvard Med School, we've evaluated a set of 16 patients in the UDN with really very unusual inflammatory or autoimmune diseases. And we've taken PBMCs from those patients, we've immunoprofiled them by mass cytometry, and we've compared those data to mass cytometry profiles of 142 comparator patients that we've analyzed for other, for other studies. And that includes almost 100 patients without inflammatory or autoimmune disease, plus 25 patients with lupus, 20 patients with RA, to give some benchmarks of what, what patients with an autoimmune disease that we know sort of looks like. And this is work that's been uh, analyzed primarily by Elisa and Taka. Elisa is a rheumatology fellow here, almost finished her fellowship uh, at the Brigham, Taka is an MD-PhD rheumatologist who's a postdoc in my lab. And so we've, as we've analyzed these profiles, what we've done essentially is to take, take that immunoprofiling data, uh, cluster the cells into populations of immune cells that roughly correspond to the populations that we know are in peripheral blood, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, monocytes, B cells, and K cells. Then we're looking at subpopulations therein and we ask across these populations, are there any patients that have a severe disruption in the abundance of any of these clusters of immune cells? And the way that we've done this is to take the cluster abundance of all these different clusters, and here out of PBMCs, we've broken it up into 30 different clusters. And then we ask, are there any patients that have a marked expansion of one of those clusters, such that they're really a dramatic outlier? And here, a dramatic outlier is defined as an outlier whose cluster abundance is twofold higher than the next highest person. So you have to be twofold higher than the, than the nearest high, next highest person, second highest person. And as we asked this, we could identify either focused on PBMCs or focused specifically on T cells, outlier features in five of the 16 patients in the UDN that we profiled. And on the other hand, 
zero out of the 142 comparator patients, including RA and lupus patients, qualified as an outlier by this metric. Uh, so you can see here, the arrows point to the five different UDN patients who were identified as outliers. And I'm gonna tell you about two of them. And one of them I'm gonna tell you briefly, which is this one. So this patient, UDN number two. So this is a 65 year old man who had a suspected autoimmune perineoplastic disease, suspected, uh, uh, but without a known malignancy, who developed these cranial nerve palsies, is found on autoantibody profiling to have autoantibodies against voltage-gated voltage -gated calcium channels. Uh, no clear disease. This is what um, the frequency of this cluster looked like for this patient. This patient has cells in this cluster. Nobody else does. These cells turn out to have, this is a B cell population. It turns out to have a discrete phenotype with high expression of BCL2 and CD5, uh, almost completely absent in the controls. And we noticed that expression of BCL2 and CD5 is sometimes associated with B cell malignancies. Uh, so we suggested that this patient should be evaluated uh, uh, again for a malignancy. He was referred back to oncology, in this case looked for hematologic malignancies. Uh, and this was found to be a, a CLL by clinical testing. So mass cytometry immunophenotyping, we could pick up a B cell a leukemia in this case. Uh, in a patient where it had been unrecognized before. Okay, um, let me tell you about the second second patient. I think this one this one is more to it. So, patient number one, you can see on this plot on the right here, UDN patient number one has um, a prominent expansion of one T cell population. And the story for this patient is that it's a 58 year old woman who is almost totally healthy until age 50, and in that time developed. Uh, a progressive uh, inflammatory skin disease that, that broadened into essentially a total body erythroderma. And she recalls that actually that what she noticed first was the loss of the ability to sweat. Uh, and then she developed these erythematous patches on her scalp first and then throughout the body. Uh, so this is involved in hydrosis, alopecia, palmar plantar kerat keratoderma, uh, many non-healing ulcers in the lower extremities, and over, over the course of several years, she had been treated with multiple anti-inflammatory therapies. So methotrexate, anti-TNF, anti-L17, anti-L4 receptor, IVIG, many, uh, uh, many courses of steroids, very difficult to control disease. Um, and while this, I think, sort of looked like an inflammatory skin disease, maybe, maybe an auto-inflammatory disease, um, the immunoprofiling pointed out this kind of striking um, abnormality in T cell profiles. So we spent some time digging into that T cell profile and I'm, I'm gonna talk about it for a couple minutes to take you through what, what we did. So if we look at the phenotype of those T cells that are expanded uniquely in this patient, the cells from this patient end up in one particular cluster here, cluster 12, which sits here. Um, and this patient has, has way too many cells in that cluster. Uh, you can see that quantified here. So if these are all the T cell clusters, cluster 12 represents um, more than half of the T cells um, for this patient. And typically it's a small population. It's a small proportion of the total T cells in the controls. When we ask about the phenotype of those cells, we actually got quite a surprise here that uh, the expanded T cell population in this patient uh, looks like regulatory T cells. They, they express a high level of CD25, a low expression of CD127. These are two features that are sort of characteristic of regulatory T cells, which we think of as anti-inflammatory or suppressive of immune responses. We've looked, uh, this is quantified here uh, by, a, by a biaxial gating approach now, just a huge expansion of this population of cells in this patient. Um, if we look cytometrically at, at those cells, you know, do they really look like Tregs? Uh, for, the, for the folks in the audience who think about Tregs, these cells by mass cytometry have a high expression of FOXP3 and Helios, Gitter, Tigit. They really cytometrically looked like legitimate Tregs. We were skeptical though, so we generated single cell RNA sequencing data uh, from the same T cells from this patient, and we overlaid those cells onto single cell RNA sequencing data that we had from 19 rheumatoid arthritis patients. 
when we cluster the single cell data of T cells, CD4 T cells, um, we can find one cluster that are clearly regulatory T cells with a high expression of FOXP3. And if we look at where the cells from this patient, this UDN patient number one, end up, they largely end up in this Treg cluster. So by cytometry and by single cell transcriptomics, that large population of cells in this patient really look like regulatory T cells. Um, we wondered about whether these cells are a leukemia or a lymphoma. They're not, in that they're, they're highly polyclonal. And we asked then about the differences between cells from this patient and cells from uh, our 19 RA patients that we had as a comparative group. And we asked about gene programs that are differentially expressed in the Tregs from this patient, UDN patient number one, compared to Tregs from RA patients. Uh, what we saw was largely an upregulation of interferon response genes and some suggestion of, uh, of an upregulation of signals that are associated with TCR, TCR activation. So perhaps some activation and perhaps a response to interferons. We then asked sort of functionally, do these cells work? Do they suppress as Tregs? And here actually, they don't. So if we purify out the CD25 high candidate Treg population from UDN patient number one and test it for its ability to suppress an effector T cell response compared to Tregs from RA patients or Tregs from controls, uh, we see these, these cells really do a poor job. They're not able to suppress an effector T cell response. So here, immunoprofiling picks up a Treg population. Uh, they look cytometrically and transcriptomically like Tregs. We can't really figure out what's wrong with them, uh, but they don't work very well. We've then gone looking in the skin for, for these cells. You know, are, are they in these inflammatory skin lesions? And it turns out that they are. So, if we look at skin biopsies from this patient, stain them for CD25 and FOXP3, there's a lot of these cells in this skin that has this kind of psoriasiform pattern, uh, much more than what we see in controls. And so we wondered from this, um, if we have a patient with uh, this unusual disease we can't quite characterize, but we know that there's this expansion of an abnormal T cell population, should we at least use a therapy that's sort of directed at T cells in some way? Uh, and and so, so this is what happened. Um, we had a discussion with the treating providers, recognizing that this is, this is uh, exploratory work. It's, it's not intended to be directly used therapeutically, but we may gain some insights that are useful. And so this patient was actually treated with, with two different therapies that, that target T cells. First, abatacept, CTLA-4-IG, which clearly directly sort of uh, influences T cell activation. Uh, and then second, with a, subsequently with a JAK inhibitor, which will inhibit T cell responses, but will do many things. And quite interestingly, as this patient was treated with first abatacept and then JAK inhibitor, both of those substantially reduced this uh, largely expanded Treg population, getting not, not quite to normal levels, but, but closer. And when we look at the cells, uh, from, from this patient over time. So now single cell RNA sequencing data again at that period of enrollment um, or after uh, abatacept treatment or after tofacitinib, um, you can see that the distribution of the cells changes so that the proportion of cells that are in this T-rate cluster are reduced, sort of fits with the quantification here. And as we ask about the transcriptomic signatures of those cells in that Treg population, are they changed at all? Um, as you might predict, see a reduction in the expression of interferon signaling genes in those Tregs as she's treated with abatacept and then treated with JAK inhibitor. You can see a reduction in the signature in the other cells as well. So I think this is a sort of systemic effect. Um, clinically, she improved to some extent with abatacept, but not all the way, which is why she didn't stay on abatacept. Uh, she then was transition to tofacitinib, a JAK inhibitor, and has done substantially better, with really a, a, quite a substantial improvement in her cutaneous disease. So what I would suggest to you from this is that here, uh, this kind of immunoprofiling doesn't, it hasn't explained the disease. We can't connect all the pieces here, but 
it highlighted one specific feature of immune dysregulation in this patient, which, which really did sort of help guide the way we thought about selecting therapies. Now, as we come back to this set of patients here, I told you there were five that we identified as severe outliers. One of them has a leukemia treated with ibrutinib. Uh, one of them is the story I just told you. Uh, we could tell a briefer a story about the other three as well, but I think quite optimistic about the ability of this kind of profiling to pick up severe dysregulation in circulating immune cells in patients with these kinds of unusual diseases. And I think this is an approach that can be, can be useful. Okay, I just want to um, address the question. So CD25, FOXP3, or upregulated and activated convention conventional T cells. That's a good point. Um, uh, you can see you can see FOXP3 and CD25 and activated uh, effector T cells as well. I think I think that um, here the levels of expression are are higher than we would, what we would see in the effector cells. And I think the transcriptomics do a pretty good job of sort of separating out the T regs from from non T regs. Um, Although it's, it's, I agree, this is a good consideration. So let me keep going here and I'm gonna switch gears again. So if you zoned out so far, come on back, I'll tell you something different. Um, so we talked about immunoprofiling in one disease to try and identify uh, features that are characteristic of that, that disease in lupus. Talked about immunoprofiling to identify sort of unique features of an individual patient with an unusual disease. And now I'm gonna talk to you about immunoprofiling to try and distinguish features of two clinically similar conditions. And, and what I'm going to focus on is immune-related adverse events, adverse events after anti-PD-1 therapy given for malignancy, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And we know it's about 5% of patients treated with anti-PD-1 antibodies that will develop an inflammatory arthritis. And we were interested in this question, uh, to what extent does the T cell infiltrate in checkpoint inhibitor arthritis resemble that of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and, and for me in particular, I was interested in this question about whether uh, anti PD1 therapy will expand a PD1 high TPH cell population, as we had seen in RA. Um, just to rehash the TPH thing, just for a moment to set the context here. So um, we had been looking in rheumatoid arthritis patients at tissue samples from RA patients. We noticed at that time by mass cytometry, this large population of a PD-1 high CD4 population, it's here, PD-1 high CXCR5 negative TPH cells in RA samples. Um, and these cells are really quite highly expanded in seropositive RA samples. This is synovial fluid as compared to seronegative arthritis. And that included seronegative RA, psoriatic arthritis, JIA. So um, when you treat a patient with an anti-PD-1 antibody, do you end up with a PD-1 high TPH population? That was the question. And the answer is no, not really. Uh, so here we collected synovial fluid from patients with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, or here checkpoint inhibitor related arthritis, profiled them by mass cytometry. We reproduced the original observation of a high frequency of PD-1 high TPH cells in RA patients and not psoriatic arthritis patients. And the checkpoint patients end up sort of close to the psoriatic arthritis patients. I, I consider this not a high level of TPH cells. Now, these patients, there's, there's six in this plot. I'm going to show you other analyses from, from other patients as well. So in total, we're talking about about 20 patients. Um, they are equally represented between males and females. They are mostly seronegative. So none of these patients have an ACPA, have an anti-CCP antibody. Some of them have rheumatoid factors. Uh, they tend to have an oligoarthritis. Um, these are patients with a number of different malignancies, and they've all been treated with an anti-PD-1 antibody. Three of them have gotten an anti-CTLA-4 antibody also. So we didn't, this is work uh, from my lab done by Ronsi Wong, who's a postdoc here who led this um, analysis of the mass, mass cytometry synovial fluid. So we didn't see TPH cells in those samples. So then we started to ask, well, are there any T cell phenotypes that are expanded in the checkpoint arthritis samples that are different from what you see in RA or psoriatic arthritis? And here I'm gonna focus on the CD8 cells because that's where we saw the biggest differences. And what we noticed is that if you look at the CD8 cells from checkpoint arthritis samples or RA samples or psoriatic arthritis samples, that the checkpoint arthritis samples had this accumulation of cells in a particular region 
of these two-dimensional TSNE plots. And when we ask about the um, frequency of the cell, this is quantified here. So high frequency of cells in this region, mostly in cluster two in the checkpoint samples compared to RA or psoriatic arthritis. If we ask about the, the phenotype of those cells, they have quite a distinctive set of markers. So these are, cell, these are cells that are um, characterized by a high expression of CD38 and an absence of CD127, the L7 receptor. So by those two markers themselves, you can pick out these CD8 cells from the rest of them pretty well. So here, just looking at CD38, CD127 in CD8 T cells from synovial fluid by biaxial gating, uh, you can reproduce the same observation of, that came out of the clustering analyses. High proportion of these cells in checkpoint arthritis and not RA or psoriatic arthritis. And as we've gone looking then to try to understand what are these cells, what's their, uh, what's their function potentially, what are their features, uh, there's a couple of things that have come out of this. So what we did was we sorted out these cells, CD38 high cells, or these cells over here, the CD127 positive cells, and a couple of other populations. We generated bulk RNA sequencing data on those sorted T cell populations from synovial fluid of checkpoint arthritis patients or RA patients or psoriatic arthritis patients. And I'm going to point out two features that are sort of characteristic of the CD8 cells that are coming out of these checkpoint arthritis samples, especially this CD38 high population. This CD38 high population uh, has a high signature for proliferation, the number of gene, high expression of genes associated with proliferation. And you can see this at the protein level, just stating for KI67, a marker of proliferation that the CD38 high cells from checkpoint arthritis samples frequently express KI67. These cells also look quite cytotoxic. They look like activated effector cytotoxic cells. So the CD38 high cells, which are the red ones here, compared to the other T cell populations, have a high expression of cytotoxicity, as high as what we see in KLRG1 positive cells, which were sort of sorted to be cytotoxic cells. They also have a high expression of a signature of genes associated with T cell effector function. And if we actually test this in vitro, we, we, we set up a cytotoxicity assay in vitro that you can use for polyclonal human T cells. If you sort out the CD38 high cells versus the CD38 negative cells, they can kill target fibroblasts more effectively than the CD127 positive cells. So in checkpoint arthritis, the CD38 high population looks activated, proliferating, cytotoxic. Uh, I'll tell you one other thing about these cells. So as we sorted out these cells from checkpoint arthritis samples or RA samples or psoriatic arthritis samples, and we asked sort of broadly about the transcriptional programs that characterize the checkpoint samples and distinguish them from RA or psoriatic arthritis, one of the signatures that came out of that was an interferon signature. So the checkpoint arthritis T cells tended to have a higher expression of interferon inducible genes across the different T cell populations, but in particular in these CD38 high cells, which are here, population five, suggesting some additional exposure to interferon in checkpoint arthritis that's sort of different than RA or psoriatic arthritis. And we wondered about whether uh, those two observations were connected. Interferon signature, the CD38 high phenotype. And we, we tested that by taking synovial fluid cells from RA patients or psoriatic arthritis patients, synovial fluid cells, and then treat them in vitro with a type 1 interferon, interferon beta, or type 2 interferon, interferon gamma, and ask whether it changes the CD38 high phenotype. Um, and what we, what we noticed here was that if we take cells from patients with RA or psoriatic arthritis and treat them with a type 1 interferon, that type 1 interferon can induce expression of CD38 and it essentially induces the CD38 high CD127 low phenotype. So it's in vitro data, but it suggests, I think, that interferon may move T cells towards this phenotype that we see expanded in checkpoint arthritis. So let me summarize this to say in checkpoint arthritis or checkpoint inhibitor associated arthritis, we see an expansion of a specific CD8 T cell phenotype that's characterized by high expression of CD38 
these cells are cytotoxic, they show an interferon signature. And I think this is interesting because it's really quite different from what we see in seropositive RA, where we see a, a marked expansion of a, a PD-1 high CD4 population that we think of as associated with providing B-cell help and, and specifically expanded in seropositive disease. So here, clinically, both autoimmune inflammatory arthritis um, uh, yet at the level of the T cell response, they look quite different. So I, I think we're getting to the point where we can start to see distinct immune effectors in these sort of clinically similar entities. And we can see this um, really with like not that many patients. Here, it's less than 10 patients per group, or much less than 10 patients per group, but quite a clear expansion of CD38 high cells in this group and an expansion of TPH cells in this group. So I, I think that these cytometric profiles actually have pretty big effect sizes and, and give us some pretty nice signatures to try and distinguish one disease versus another. Now, we don't need cytometry to tell you if the patient has RA or checkpoint arthritis. That's, that's not the idea. But I think instead, uh, these kinds of profiles can point us towards potentially the cell populations that are most activated or more ex most expanded in one disease versus another to give us a foothold to start to think about the inflammatory pathways that may be active in one condition versus another. We just make the point here that while what I've shown you for checkpoint arthritis has been in synovial fluid, we can see some of this in the blood. So um, the signals are not as big, the populations are much smaller, but if we look for CD38 high cells in peripheral blood, patients with checkpoint arthritis, RA, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, you can see these cells expanded in checkpoint arthritis patients compared to RA and psoriatic arthritis. And interestingly, these cells are expanded in patients with lupus as well, a disease that's sort of characterized by type 1 interferon. Uh, I think this is consistent with what George Sokos has described uh, in lupus as well. And on the other hand, we see TPH cells in seropositive RA, not in these seronegative conditions. Um, and I don't, have it, I don't have it on this plot for checkpoint arthritis patients, but, but I think we do have those data now, and we really don't see much of an expansion of TPH cells in the blood either. So let me conclude with this, this idea that I was I started with. So um, as we think about tools to assess what the immune system is doing, uh, just as a, no, we don't, we, don't have, we don't have an echo. We don't have an echocardiogram like a cardiologist has. But what we might end up with is a, an immuno profile, an immuno profile that tells you the uh, abundance of cell populations in blood that are reflective of different immune pathways. And the challenge now, I think, is to go from these observations out of discovery cohorts um, to validate those things and distill them down to sort of simpler metrics that we can use clinically that can be quantified in a cost-effective manner that can be done in a clinical laboratory and end up with perhaps something, a metric like a lymphocyte activation score is one example that we can use that to help guide uh, our decision-making as we assess prognosis and, and potentially treatment response in patients. So just as we have a pulmonary function test or a liver function test, I think of immunophenotyping as an immune function test is what is, the, what is the functioning of the immune system right now? What is it actually doing? Um, and I'm enthusiastic about the potential for these kinds of approaches uh, to help us understand immune dysregulation in patients with rheumatic diseases going forward. All right, so I'll stop there. Let me say a couple of thank yous. So uh, I really benefit from the team here at the, at the Brigham. Uh, I started the RA work in Michael Brenner's lab, co-mentored by Shoma Ray Chaudhry. Um, the work has extended into lupus really with a uh, close collaboration with Karen Kostenbader and Elena Maserati. I told you about the work in the UDN Undiagnosed Disease Network that's been led by Elisa and Taka in my lab. Ron Si Wong did the checkpoint arthritis immunoprofiling. Alice, Catherine, and Garrett have been essential for much of the cellular profiling overall. Uh, thankful for the participation in the AMP, which generated the mass cytometry data that I told you about and uh, many other data sets that we haven't discussed today. And the checkpoint work is really a very close collaboration with Laura Donlin and Bass and Anvita, who's a graduate student in Laura's lab, uh, 
at the hospital for special surgery in New York. We sort of pulled samples for this. We pulled analyses for this. And uh, all, all of that is um, uh, essentially a 50-50 a collaboration. So thanks very much. I'm happy to, to discuss any of these ideas. Thank you so much, Deepak. This is a fantastic presentation. And um, I see we have a couple of questions. I don't know, did you want to select any particular one or do you prefer if I uh, guide it? Oh, no, you're welcome. You're welcome to. Uh, let's let's start a little bit in the beginning, because I think many of us were interested in this kind of um, the scoring system, the lymphocyte activation score. And the question really being whether it can only distinguish between lupus and other diseases, or if there is any kind of, can you also use it to stratify within patients and to see disease activity or different disease phenotypes? Yeah, so these are these are these are essential questions to sort of um, understand where, where where this could go. Um, it's really very early. We're still getting our heads around it. But I'll, I'll tell you what I have in mind. I, I don't think I don't, it's not going to be a lupus specific test. So um, this activation of TPH cells and TFH cells and ABCs is not it's not specific to lupus. It's it's prominent in lupus, which is why I think lupus is a good disease. Um, to sort of develop it in. Um, but we can certainly see activation or expansion of these cell populations in, in other diseases. And um, I think that the, the, you know, does it correlate with disease activity? I think so. I don't I can't show you that enough patients to convince you yet, but you know I, I, I think we'll get there. Um, what I have in mind is essentially using this like we use a CRP. Mm -hmm. you know, like we don't really worry too much about the disease specificity or sensitivity of a CRP. We use it in a different way. We sort of use it as an assessment of the overall level of inflammation. Right. And um, in this, I think what I envision using this metric or something like it as an overall assessment of um, TB collaboration, or maybe maybe it's you know maybe it's extra follicular. TB collaboration, mm -hmm. just something like that. Um, but some one feature of adaptive immune cell activation, um, and I think you will see it abnormal in some patients with 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 Sjogren's, and you'll see it's abnormal in patients with RA. Uh, I think it looks pretty normal in patients with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, but um, just as we sort of follow a CRP or an ESR. Um, I, I think, you know, I would, I would like to get to the point where we could follow something like this too. And do you think, I mean, just I know you don't have so many patients yet, but do you think it will track with, let's say, what we currently measure, such as CRP or double strand the DNA or complement, or do you think it could be complementary to it? Will it add, if you would? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it will track with double stranded DNAs. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the line of thinking is right, that Right. You know, double stranded DNAs are coming from short-lived plasma blasts and ABCs, and um, you know you have you have a activation of this pathway. Those are the cells producing double stranded DNAs. You suppress the pathway, and the double stranded DNAs come down. Uh, I think those are going to correlate, but but maybe you know then then it's a question about you know is it is it more robust or less robust? I have no idea. Right, and maybe um, maybe it will be more broadly than so. Maybe it won't be specific to double strand the DNA, but more as you said, generally autoimmune kind of or activation of the autoimmune condition. So you will capture many more kind of antibody producing cells. I think that's right. I think that's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it'll, it'll be different. It's gonna. It's, I think it's gonna be different than complements. Mm -hmm. The complements are picking up on a, a somewhat different arm. And you have genetics issues when it comes to complement deficiency as well, at least for C4. Um, before we're getting into the other questions, of course, me, I, I need to ask the, this question that I think many of us ask. You're focusing on PBMCs. As such, you're missing out on an important component, which is the neutrophil. What do you think about neutrophil kind of uh, subsets and all of that? Do you think that, that we're missing out on, on not looking at them? So I, would, <laughs> I, would, I would defer to you on you know what, what we should be looking at in neutrophils. Um, uh, we, uh, it's really, I have to admit, it's a blind spot for me. I've, I've, I've not thought about it enough and I, I should. And I, I've but, I, I, no, no worries. I was yeah. curious. Um, yeah. But uh, it, I'll just quickly go back to the questions here. Uh, this is one from Keith Elkin asking about the, um, with the checkpoint patients, if they also have grand sign K for the CD8, similar to what uh, Helena Johnson is looking at. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I don't have a straightforward answer to that. And we've looked at this pretty carefully. Uh, I think as we look at the CD38 high cells in um, synovial fluid from these checkpoint arthritis patients, we can find some of them express granzyme B, some of them express granzyme B and granzyme K. Mm -hmm. um, so, so from that point of view, it, it is sort of similar to what, what Helena described um, of the T cells in, in RA, where there's a lot of these granzyme K cells with you know a lot of granzyme K, a little bit of granzyme B. But, but um, it's uh, I think that I think that there's a lot. I think there's a larger population of the granzyme B, straight up granzyme B cytotoxic cells in these checkpoint samples. Um, but but they tend, for whatever reason, they tend to get lumped together as we do the dimensional reduction and clustering. So it hasn't been totally obvious to sort of make that point. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Um, a couple of more questions here. Let's, let's take it from the beginning uh, with Jane Buckner asking about somatic mutations in these abnormally expanded uh, cell populations. Is that anything you have considered or looked, looked into? I think that's, I think it's a really interesting area. You know, we did definitely, definitely have been thinking about it. We haven't done very much with it. Um, for, for these UDN patients, um, where we, where we can see expansion of, of T cell populations, um, you know, they're, they're so polyclonal that I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, it can't be, it's not rogue clones. It's not like, you know, some clones that have acquired lymphoma driver mutations and have expanded, and those are the ones that are causing disease, kind of like the Chris Good now, um, mm -hmm. you know, Shogun's idea, uh, because because it's a very polyclonal population um, in, in, in a couple of these patients. And I, I think, you know, in, in rheumatoid arthritis, if, if there were going to be, you know, somatic mutations in T cells causing these diseases, I, I guess I sort of think that we should see large clones then um, that should come out of the TCR sequencing. And it, it just hasn't, that hasn't been obvious so far. Um, in some of these diseases, it definitely for like the, the individuals in the UDN, somatic mutations is like, got it, it has to be looked at. I think it's going to be, it's going to be useful. And um, I don't know whether it's going to, it makes more sense to think about it in the lymphocytes or the myeloid cells, you know, from Vexus, maybe it makes more sense in myeloid cells. Um, so it's a good, it's a good question. We haven't really explored it in detail. I have this hesitation about like, you know, if, if the T cells look quite polyclonal, then I, then it seems less likely to me, but I'm, I'm open to being wrong on that. Cool. Excellent. Um, two more question, questions and maybe there will be more coming in, but this one is from Katie Wisham and saying such great work. Thank you for sharing. Um, for the UDN patient with a severe skin disease, why do you think there was a differential response to the different medicines and whether it could relate to the tissue penetration with Jackie versus Abatacept? Yeah, yeah, we, we want, that's a good question. We've wondered about this. Um, I mean, it could be that the JAK inhibitors are doing a number of things and, um, you know, those JAK inhibitors will slow down the ability of the, the keratinocytes to respond to, to to interferons and um, uh, it may be, maybe doing a number of things beyond just targeting the T cell response. Maybe that's where the added benefit is. Um, and we haven't, we haven't, I'm not, is it, it becomes a challenge to sort of tease that out. But that, I, right. my, my hunch is that they're just, it's doing, it's doing more. Excellent. And then the last question for now, and I may sneak in one more at the end, we'll see. Uh, it's from Mark Wenner, who calls this an interesting and provocative talk. And he's asking whether immunophenotyping actually is a functional test or function test, uh, referring that echo and PFT would be dynamic and measure function, but immunophenotyping would be more static, equivalent to chest CT. So is there progress toward clinically useful immune stimulation tests to measure dynamic immune function in autoimmune patients? Great. Oh, that's a great question. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to revise the semantics. If I just call <laughs> I'm looking for advice or you know, input on that. Um, this is a good, it's a good point. Um, we haven't really talked here about uh, challenging the immune system to actually mm -hmm. see uh, test, not testing its function. We're sort of testing what it's up to, like, you know, what, right. to what like we would do for the TB test or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like, you know, folks, clinical immunologists are think about things like, you know, vaccinating against uh, pneumococcus and then measuring pneumococcal titers or mm -hmm. you know, T cell mitogen proliferation. Um, I, I, I really like the idea of, of bringing some of that in. Like, you know, t, like we have a T-spot for TV. Why don't we have a lupus mm -hmm. equivalent to that? 
um, I think that'd be fun. You know, I think that'd be great. I agreed. And then, uh, and then finally, I was intrigued by your interference uh, signature, of course, and then the driving of CD38 and all of that. And I think you said something about it being kind of up in the interference gamma or alpha, I can't remember, was or the interference signature was up in most RA cells, but was it primarily only in T cells or did you see that kind of broadly in most immune cells? So my question is really, are there specific interferon producing or affected cells, or do you see it more kind of broadly if you see interferon? So yeah, so we see um, an increased interferon signature in the checkpoint arthritis samples compared, compared to RA. It's lower in RA and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, you know, I, we really have only generated data on the T cells. So I don't know. I don't know about the rest of the cells. Right. My hunch is that it'll, it'll, it'll be there everywhere. You know, right. So you, so you see it as a, you think of it as a systemic kind of effect rather than a yeah. cell in, intrinsic kind of. I think that's right. I think that's right. Although you know, we have just to close the thought. We we have looked for whether there's um, an interference signature in PBMCs from those checkpoint arthritis patients, and there actually is quite difficult uh. to pick it up. Uh, you, you can see it. You can see it in the cells from the joint, but not. It's not so easy to pick up. You know, in the circulation. So, what would be producing it? You think? Do you think it is the T cells, or you think it's joint fibroblast or anything? Yeah, I don't know. Right, could be fibroblasts. Could could be or, myeloid uh, cells. Could, mm -hmm. could be the T cells. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, many many more things to explore. Yeah. So. Um, Unless any other questions, thank you again so much for for spending your time with us and for sharing all of your data. It's been a, it's been a treat to all of us, and um, hopefully we'll be able to attend your, some of your sessions at ACR maybe and learn more about your upcoming work. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Take care.